Hi, welcome to the Noise Path. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This is a Keysight U1253B, and this is an instrument with an OLED screen. There are a family of Keysight multimeters that do have the OLED screen, and they're really bright and easy to read, and they're quite nice to look at, as OLED t uh, screens typically tend to be. But unfortunately, they do develop a problem over time. Apparently, the OLED screens that was used in these degrade, even if you don't use them at all. Now, OLEDs do, do have these burning conditions that happen to them if you have, let's say, the same pixels always on. But even if you don't use this, the OLED essentially dies. I'm not exactly sure what the failure mechanism is. It could be the OLED itself. It could be some control circuitry that's on there. But even if you don't turn it on and just leave it in the closet, this does happen. In fact, this unit is essentially brand new when it's been sitting in somebody's cabinet and it doesn't work. And that's how I found it on eBay. Now, these things also don't have a very good battery life, but that's a separate issue. But otherwise, they're really nice multimeters and it's worth restoring them. Now, it turns out that the model of the OLED used in these screens is a very rare model. And there is a some one that's very similar to it. But if you install that, the screen is flipped, which means that the control uh, signaling is a little bit different. So the algorithms by which you write to the screen is slightly different, which makes the replacement very difficult. I searched on eBay and I found a replacement kit for it. It was still pretty expensive. It was as expensive as what I paid for this itself. But I thought, hey, maybe we can try a look and see if that brings it back to life. And maybe it's something that we can learn from. So let's take it apart and try it out. So I took the screws out. And, and by the way, when you do turn this on, as I said, nothing shows up, but it does make a beeping noise. So maybe something is booting internally. So I took the screws out, I took the battery away. So these are, are, are going to have, you know, essentially pretty good build quality as, as it is typical with Keysight instruments. So you're going to get a good multimeter for sure. There's two OLEDs in the back here. They're infrared. They shine through this opening over here, which is used to communicate with this remotely. We have a piece electric speaker over there and grounding the back over here for noise suppression and just EMI protection and the connections to the speaker. There's absolutely nothing else on this side as it is typical in order to create sufficient protection and hide everything underneath. So we're going to have to open a few more screws to take a look inside. So here's the internal of the multimeter. It all comes out in one piece. And as you would expect, it has very good input protection. It does have very nice connection to the PCB from the terminals itself. Cutouts in the right areas, clearances in the right areas. We can talk about that a little bit later. I'm mostly interested in taking a look at the OLED. Now, this itself is a module. It should be easily removable. So if you remove the screws, we should be able to just unplug this. And I'll show you the replacement and what they've done in terms of strategy to basically make a drop-in replacement to this one with a different OLED uh, model number, because this is apparently very difficult to find. Let's take a look. This is the face of a cat who's about to cause some trouble. He's going to hide around, and at the opportune moment, he's going to attack my hand when I least expect it. So the display module itself is Agilent branded, but of course the main OLED is not made by Agilent, but this conversion board is. It has some DC power supply conversion over here and some level shifter, and it just feeds directly into the ribbon. So here's the controller IC for the OLED itself, and the OLED ribbon just wraps right around. Now the model number of the OLED is the SSD1303, and I think the SSD1309 is what most people want to replace this with. But that again, that flips the display. So what you need essentially is to know the protocol required to write into this module and then convert it into, retranslate it essentially into a new one. So you could read the same interface, change it, and then fit it into a new OLED with the same dimensions and so on. And I think that's what that conversion kit is doing. But let's compare this to what the conversion kit actually looks like. And here's the replacement display. Now it's using a completely different OLED, of course. It may have a similar controller, but nonetheless the sequence will have to be completely changed, the sequence of data to write to it. If I flip it on the other side, it's a clear drop-in replacement. The connector's in the same place as the screw's in the same place. But we need now to retranslate the pattern that's coming from the multimeter before it's written to the actual LCD or OLED controller. Now how would you do this? Well, you could put the microcontroller in here read everything and then retransmit it into the OLED after you change and interpret the data. The problem with that would most likely be latency because you're going to have to now wait for packets to be done before you can retransmit them. Instead, they're using a lattice ICE 4 d Ultra Series FPGA, which retranslates this as real time as possible and reconfigures the data and shifts it around or whatever that needs to be done to write to the new OLED. It does have a port here to program the FPGA. It also does have a ribbon connector here. Maybe they're using several different versions of this OLED and just all using the same board. It's very nice. It could be because it's also maybe for multiple versions of it. So a lot of effort has obviously gone into redesigning this and making sure it works and everything. So I'm eager to drop it into the multimeter and see if it works. It's very nicely done. I don't know what the deal with the sticker is, but I do, do like these kind of birds. 
So let's power this with the Rodenshorst NGM202, which by the way I've done a full review and teardown of as well on the channel. And 9 volts, 0.1 amp as a maximum. Let's turn it on. So right now it's obviously not on. In standby, it's essentially burning nothing. So it does go into deep, deep sleep, which is good. And I think this Allen key fits perfectly in the rotary switch here. Let's see if we can turn it on. What do we have here? Oh, oh look at that. Wait, I think it's in between two states here. Ah, there it is. That is beautiful. That's a very nice display. So yeah, this is a good replacement kit. Look how bright and the contrast ratio on OLEDs, of course, as to be expected, is very, very good. Now this thing is burning. Ooh, that's a lot. It's burning 0.38 watts. So yeah, it is significant. And that is part of the problem of these series. It does run out of battery fairly quickly. It does come with a rechargeable 9 volt battery, but the choice to use a 9 volt battery, I think it was a mistake. They should have just gone with multiple double A's and, and figured out if there was a way to optimize the power supply of the actual OLED a little bit better. But nonetheless, this should still be a very good multimeter. Well, it's been a couple of days and we have a bit of a mitosis situation going on here. Well, this is what happens when you leave me unattended on eBay. So I sell one more of these and I just had to buy it because it was only 25 or $30. It was also listed as broken. So I assumed that the OLED on this one had also gone bad and I wanted to investigate that. Now, it was in terrible shape. It was really dirty and you can see there's a bit of damage over here. I spent a long time cleaning it so you're seeing the end result here. Now, this came with its own nickel metal hydride battery built in and it was completely discharged. Now, the way you charge these batteries is that you plug a power supply into here. So you're using the amp inputs to also charge the battery when it's in the off position. So if this 440 milliamp fuse is dead, you actually can't charge the battery because that fuse has double purpose. One is, of course, on the amp measurement and the other one is to protect the battery in case something goes wrong. So someone had blown that fuse and they couldn't charge the battery and they didn't even bother changing it. So this was completely discharged and I guess they assumed that the OLED was dead. So they just sold it like that. And well, I just changed the fuse and it works. There's nothing wrong with it. It's funny that this is an adjutant one, so it's even older, but its OLED is still alive and this one is not. So I wonder how that happened. So if I turn it on, check it out. Let's have this goofy startup tone that it plays. And this is the one that I changed the OLED on. If you look, if you look carefully, there is a slight difference in the color temperature. This is a little bit more orange yellow color. This is a little bit more towards the green. Now that flickering you see, I do not see that at all. That's the frame rate of the camera. I might be able to change that and you might be able to get rid of it. Yeah, so it's not an, not an issue really. It depends on how I'm recording it. So now we have two of these and are, they're essentially identical except for the date for which they were manufactured. So let's do some parallel testing and see if they still meet any specification. Let's do a very quick test on these two meters just to make sure that they're functional. I'm going to use this Keysight 3458A as a reference. This is of course an eight and a half digit multimeter. And we have a universal source up here. This is a 32458. They don't make this one anymore, unfortunately, at the top. But we have the two meters on here. So let's go ahead and do some measurements. We're in the millivolt range. Let's apply half a volt DC. Let's make sure that it works in the millivolt region. There's half a volt. And, well, this one is <laughs> really spot on. But, of course, we're comparing it against this here because this hasn't been calibrated for some time. But the measurements are very, very close to each other indeed. So let's switch that to the actual voltage measurement now. And let's go to 1 volt. Make sure it does read 1 volt. Yep, pretty good. Let's try 5 volts. Like so. And that's also fine. Now we can switch this into the times 10 multiplication. I'm switching a little BNC on the right side. You just can't see it. Now we have a times 10 multiplication on this voltage. So we are now 50 volts. And I believe I can set this to 10 over here. And it's going to give us 100 volts. You can see this is 100.01. This is exactly 100. This is reading just a little bit under. I think it's fine. Okay, let's try some DC currents. Now the meters are all in series, of course. So I can measure current all at the same time. Let's try something small. Let's say 0 0.0001, enter, here we go. What do we have? 100 microamp, that's exactly what it should be. They're all reading about 100 microamps, so I'm quite happy with that. Let's try, oops, let's try 10 milliamp, which is quite a bit higher. So these are now in overload because in one, we're in microamp range. I can switch them to milliamp range and they should read, yeah, very close to 10. So I think it's working quite well. Quick resistance measurement on this key site. Let's try one mega ohm. Perfect. Let's try 500. Looks good. 100. Yeah, I think it's fine. We can now switch from this one to this one and do exactly the same thing. Just doing very quick tests to make sure it works. Mega ohm again. 500. 
no problem. How about 30? Yeah, that's spot on. I don't think there's anything wrong with the ohms measurement either. I think the only thing left is really to do some AC voltage measurement. So how about measuring the line voltage on the meter on the left coming into the house? Expecting about 120 something. If I can make a connection. There it is, 122 volts. Looks about right. And now the meter on the right, 122. Okay, I think it's okay. So there you have it, just a really quick video exploration of these OLED replacements, so they're indeed possible and worth doing. These are really fast meters. I, I like how quickly they respond. Yeah, they only have about 10 hours of battery life, but you can gang charge them all in a row. Now they have new nickel metal hydride batteries in them with 300 milliamp hour capacity. So I think, you know, generally okay. And I am working on several videos. There's lots of really interesting content coming up. So it's just some fillers in between. Keep an eye out on the channel. There should be lots of more content coming soon.